Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the Buffalo and Erie County Historical Society, Buffalo, New York. It is, okay, what is the date? 1024. Four. Uh, 2006, approximately 9 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Yes. My name is Deborah Maria Ransom. I was born March 22, 1953, in Buffalo, New York. Okay. What was your educational background prior to entering service? Prior to entering service, of course, like anybody else, I went to uh, kindergarten, you know, elementary school, high school, and college. Uh, those schools were School 41, School 39, School 37, uh, East High School, and I graduated from McKinley High School as an advertising arts major. Mm -hmm. And you had college before you went into service? Yes, I did. How much time? Um, I had four years of college. I didn't complete 12 hours uh, before I went into the military. As soon as I got out of the military, I immediately went back to Buffalo State College on Elmwood Avenue in Buffalo. And then I completed uh, my undergraduate degree. Then I continued on that next semester with my master's degree at Buffalo State College. Okay. Now, of course, at the time you entered service, you enlisted. Yes, um, I did. Why, why did you make that decision? You know, uh, what, to be totally honest, Everybody doesn't go to the military strictly because of honorism mm -hmm. or patriotism or things like that. In my particular situation, I went to the military or was inspired to go to the military because I had a bad second marriage. I had been married at 17 years old on 11th grade in high school. I got a divorce. I married again at 22 years old. That marriage was also failing. So one day, as my marriage was failing, I saw an advertisement on TV, and it said, be all you can be. And I said, you know what? I'm going to be all I can be without it. <laughs> and that's what inspired me to go, mm -hmm. because things were not the way I needed or wanted them to be. And I was also a young mother. So to be able to have made that move, that was the right move for me, and I don't regret it. Mm -hmm. How did, I noticed you said you were the first woman to enter the military in your family. How, how did the family feel about that? Especially you were, I mean, I, I know you were, quote, older, too. You weren't yeah. just a better oh, high yeah. school. That's true. Um, well, my brother had served in the military. Uh, he was the brother right under me. I'm the mm -hmm. oldest out of five children. So uh, he had been in during the Vietnam War. I went in right after that. And ironically, I went in around the same time as my first husband that had gone into the Air Force. My dad was also a veteran uh, during World War II, mm -hmm. so they were excited about me going and they always knew that I would do whatever I felt was good for me at the time, regardless if nobody else understood. Mm -hmm. As long as I understood, that was a good thing. Mm -hmm. Why did you pick the Army? You know, I'm not totally sure, but I like the Marines outfits. <laughs> oh, they were good. You know, uh, Navy, I like their outfits. But I guess it was just something about the Army. I think when I saw the ad, it was about the Army. Mm -hmm. And it was just a calling. I just said, no, I need to go. And okay. I did. Now, when, when did you go into service? I was in the delayed entry program uh, on April 5th, 1976. Then I actually got on Fort McClellan's base, or uh, Fort uh, McClellan, Alabama's mm -hmm. uh, you know, Army base at May 20th, 1976. Okay. Um, so that, that's where you went for your basic? Basic NAIT, my advanced training, yes. Okay. What was it like there? When I did basic, you know, that was really something that you can't really be prepared for. I, one of the things that stood out, even though I was good at what I did as far as uh, physical training and all those kinds mm -hmm. of things, taking orders and whatnot. I didn't know people got recycled. You know, you can go into basic and then have to go through again. I wouldn't have wished that on my worst enemy. <laughs> <laughs> but it was exciting. It was uh, something that I felt victorious in. 
that I did accomplish that again. I'm, I'm one of those people that I like to accomplish things. If I set out to do something, I want to complete that task. Mm -hmm. And to be able to have graduated from basic training and have my family see me marching with my uh, military brothers and sisters, that was honorable, that was special. That was something that was emotionally rewarding. So mm -hmm. it was a good thing. Mm -hmm. Now you had a child, son or daughter? Yes, a son. So he was six years where old. Where was he? Well, he was with the husband that uh, we were breaking up. Mm -hmm. He kept my son, uh, Cornelius, uh, while I was in basic and uh, AIT, which later on I moved him with my parents. Uh, to be with you know my family mm -hmm. members, but what did happen is that my son was one of the many children that started coming over seas to Germany with their single parents, mm -hmm. and I think that's what led to later on having people sign over their children or making sure there's something else, uh, some provisions mm -hmm. that were made before a single parent went into the military. Mm -hmm. So even though it was an unusual situation. We made the best that, uh, out of the situation that we could. There were many people that were supportive. You know, my other uh, soldier brothers and sisters. My son stayed in the barracks with me. And we still talk about that now when in a bay of 40 women, you have a young six-year-old boy that has to say, man on the floor, man on the floor. Because anytime a man comes on the floor, mm -hmm. women have to be notified yes. because you know, mm -hmm. they're in various stages of dress. Mm -hmm. And my son was just the hit in our bay. Mm -hmm. And he would go into people's rooms. They were just inviting him in. It turned out to be a wonderful time. There were times when we marched, you know, doing our, our extra routines. Other soldiers would put him on their shoulders and would carry him. And it was just something that even he still remembers now mm -hmm. at 36 years old. <laughs> Now, um, just, I guess, on the side of that, did he go to school there on, on base? Yes. Uh, he went to Martin Luther King School oh. that they had in Mainz, Germany. Mm -hmm. And for a short time, he lived on the economy at 143 Mainzestrasse. And the people on the economy, the German people were really kind. They were really loving. They loved uh, Cornelius's color of his skin. Mm -hmm. He had a caramel color of skin. Uh, they loved his curly hair, they would love to touch it. And it was interesting to see how people reached out to each other, especially when there were differences, mm -hmm. that people appreciated that people were different and that they were kind. Mm -hmm. You know, they were willing to show a mm -hmm. young child, and in my situation, a young black child, male at that, you know, how things could be, how there isn't racism, how people aren't mean, mm -hmm. and all those kinds of things, and I really appreciated that. Okay. How much time did you spend in Germany? Wow, I spent 18 months in Germany. Um, I, you know, there was a, a thing that happened one time. My son and I were walking down the Rhine River, you know, because we wanted to see a lot of Germany. It was so beautiful, it was like a pop-up storybook. I had to call my mom for 15 dollars a minute to tell her how beautiful it was. The people were so clean, everything was clean and friendly. And we were walking down the Rhine River and we were on our way back home. Because I said, okay, you know, let's go back home. And I was walking in the wrong direction. My son said, Mommy, mommy, no, this is not the way to go. We have to go back. Do you know if I would have listened to my six-year-old son? We wouldn't have had to catch a cab, which the cabs there were Mercedes, all the way back <laughs> because I didn't listen to my intelligent son tell me, no, mommy, that's the wrong way to go. <laughs> so I think at wartime, with a compass or without, I would take my son's advice on which direction to go. <laughs> um, okay, before you went to Germany, uh, what additional training did you have? Wow. Um, well, I did the, the basic training right. and the advanced training for mm -hmm. military police. Both of those were at Fort McClellan, Alabama, and Anniston, Alabama. Now, did you sign up to be in the military police? or? Yes, you... yes, okay. I did. I signed up for military police, but I actually wanted to go into corrections. 
And because Mill Trade Police was close to corrections, even though I wasn't working, you know, in a stockade or something mm -hmm. like that, I still felt that that was emotionally rewarding. How long was that school? Uh, I think it was another eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Eight weeks of basic and eight weeks of advanced training. Then after that, I had a well-deserved 30-day uh, leave and went back home to my family and shared all the exciting experiences and things. And then I was stationed in Mainz, Germany. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I guess you've told us, what, what, what were your duties while you were there? Well, I did a variety of things uh, as a military police woman. I did a lot of patrol work, riding up and down uh, the German streets, making sure that uh, people were safe, especially dependent families and other military personnel. Mm -hmm. Then uh, from there, I was working in the uh, military police station. And that was interesting because uh, I was able not only to drive some of the patrol cars or ride as a passenger, uh, a co-pilot in the patrol cars, but to be able to send patrol cars to different incidents and things like that. So that was exciting also. And keep records and, and all those things that are important to keeping any police station, military or otherwise, in tip-top working condition. Mm -hmm. okay. um, what were your officers like? Well, the majority of the officers, I think, were supportive and understanding. Uh, they were not sexist or racist, but not that I hadn't run into a few that mm -hmm. I believe, in my particular experiences, were sexist and were racist. But because of the type of woman that I am, uh, believing that I have strength, courage, integrity, and those kinds of things that I brought with me to the military, I wasn't going to let that deter me on being the best soldier mm -hmm. I could be. Do you think you ever had any incidences where you were treated differently because you were a woman or you were black? I think so. I had put in uh, to become an officer. I felt I deserved the position, that I do have leadership abilities, not just with the training that I had in the military for leadership, but otherwise. And I think that one of my commanding officers uh, did stand in the way of that. And then later on, unfortunately, near the time that I was leaving, a black captain did sign the orders or the papers for me to go to officer training school had I chosen to do that. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide not to? Um, because I had had enough. I had done my three years. That was my commitment. Mm -hmm. And I felt that someone else can continue on that what I had learned and what I had gained from my military experience, there was no more to actually get that I wanted to uh, address and deal with other horizons in my life. What so, rank were you at that point? I, I came in the military as a PFC, an E3, and because of my uh, educational background, then I had an advancement to an E4, special list mm -hmm. E4, so that was a soft strike. Then I had a lateral promotion where I became corporal. Then that was also an E4, but a lateral promotion to a hard strike. And I was proud of that. Um, where did you go after Germany? After Germany, I went to El Paso, Texas and Fort Bliss, and that's where I did my end tour of service. Now, was, was your son able to go with you? Or? Yes, because then um, I was staying, you know, uh, in civilian mm -hmm. uh, quarters and whatnot, so that was good. Mm -hmm. What were some experiences that you think really stood out while you were in the service? Wow. One that really, really stands out amongst everything else that I did, and there were wonderful things, there were things that weren't so wonderful, all of it memorable. One day I was at the military police station and I was directing patrol cars go here and there. And a call came in uh, from one of the military police officers saying that they needed me to uh, replace or to get off of the desk and be replaced by someone so that I can assist in a situation that was going on with a female dependent. And I thought, ooh, 
you know, <laughs> this must be really something. Mm -hmm. But I also knew in my trainings that uh, anytime a woman is involved in a situation, another female uh, police person would have to be on the mm -hmm. scene to address whatever situations, be it a frisk situation or some kind of situation where there might be some type of body contact. So, I wasn't told what was going on. I just told I needed to get there. When I got there, um, assessing the situation and, and being briefed on what was going on, there was a black woman that was a dependent wife and she had gone into a, a mental breakdown. She was in the streets of Germany in the complete nude. And it was wintertime. So here she is, out here in the nude, hollering, screaming, singing, dancing, just going through a whole lot of emotional things. And my job at the time was to get the sheet over her, because also mm -hmm. the uh, rescue squad was there to transport her to the hospital. Um, put the sheet over her and get her safely into uh, the, uh, the hospital van. And as I approached this lady, she came to my face and she put her hands on my face like this and we were like this close apart. And she was saying, <laughs> breathing in my face. But I wasn't afraid. Mm -hmm. I knew this was another woman like me. It could have been me. Mm -hmm. So as she did this, you know, I just stood there. I let her blow in my face. Then she started singing. And then I started singing with her. And then I said, okay, well now, can I put this sheet on you so you won't be cold? And she said, all right. And then we started working around. I started putting the sheet around her and embracing her. And then I said, okay, right now, we need to get in the ambulance. Can I come with you and we can go to the ambulance? And she was saying, okay. And I was so moved. And all the other MPs and the hospital personnel were just standing there and all like, mm -hmm. you know, like, wow, this is going pretty good, you know? And I felt really proud that she was able to go and, and go to have her, her mental health evaluation at the hospital, that there was no incident getting into the, the uh, ambulance, there was no incident uh, on the way to the hospital, and that uh, I was part of that. I was part of the team, and I played a major role, and I'll never forget that. Mm -hmm. And the thing that happened after that, the husband, which was a military personnel, uh, we had to notify him to let him know mm -hmm. what had happened. And he broke down and cried because he had just left his wife. Nothing had happened that was uh, different from any other day. He had left and gone to work, and then here we are calling him to tell him his wife had a nervous breakdown. And But he was thankful that someone was there, that his wife wasn't hurt, and that she was transported without incident to a military hospital where he was able to go see her. So that was one of the most memorable experiences that I had. It's something I felt very proud of, that I was able to conduct myself in such a manner, and along with my team of uh, military brothers and sisters, to be able to get something accomplished for one of our dependents very well. And after that, I went into mental health for a while, dealing with those same types of situations. Did you uh, ever receive any notification of, of uh, or certificates or anything for what you did in that case? Not in that particular situation, which I must say, um, I was a bit disappointed because mm -hmm. I felt that was, it was my job, but I believed that I had gone beyond mm -hmm. the call of duty. And I would have liked to have been recognized for that. And I think that's one of the things that I uh, speak about, you know, as I talk about maybe there was some sexism, some racism, because anyone else who would have done that same thing, uh, I'm sure, would have got some kind of accommodation. And I've seen others, uh, white male, 
uh, that have gotten accommodations for things that were much less. Mm -hmm. So even though I did not get uh, an award or some kind of accommodation for that, I'm still proud of what I've done. I've done what I needed to do regardless. And I think that's what we all need to remember is that you might not get recognized for everything that you do. It might be in the military, it might be in civilian life, but do what you feel is right. Do what's in your heart. Mm -hmm. That's where the real reward comes in. Mm -hmm. okay. When you uh, went back, to, went to Texas, what were your assignments there? Much of the same. Mm -hmm. uh, being on post, uh, you know, making sure that civilians and uh, military personnel were safe, um, you know, driving patrol cars, um, being on the military police station, those types of things. What did your son think of Texas? Was he disappointed uh, after being in Germany? <laughs> <laughs> no, he was excited because he was with his mom, mm -hmm. doing all the different things uh, that most children his age, especially black children, don't do. Mm -hmm. And he was doing it with his mom, which is different than doing it with your dad. And he was able to see Germany and live there for 18 months. He was able to go to Paris, to go to Holland. I remember when I was in high school, and I used to say, when I get rich, I'm going to have breakfast in Paris and lunch in Rome. And I was having breakfast in Paris. <laughs> I was like, duh, where is my lunch in Rome? I was just, I was so stunned. You never know the things that you might say flippantly that mm -hmm. might end up happening. Mm -hmm. And then um, when my son went not just to these other countries, that was making him a more worldly child. Then when we went to Texas, he experienced things like me, like real life tumbleweeds. I only saw that on TV. <laughs> I mean, to actually see real life tumbleweeds, I had to call my mom again. <laughs> because I just didn't believe certain things that I was seeing, which again lets you know that when you go to different places, you meet different people, uh, you see different cultures and, and different places, there are different things that stick out. Things that you see on TV that you're right there at. Mm -hmm. I remember going to Paris with my son and standing in front of these towers and buildings and statues that are on postcards. And I'm here. I'm here in front of that. I would have never gotten the chance to do that otherwise. Mm -hmm. So being in the military has given me much more than just uh, knowing how to protect my fellow man and, and doing some other things. It has enriched me in so many other ways. You know, when I go to New York and I've been in one fashion capital of the world, I've also been in the other, to Paris. Mm -hmm. And it's just exciting. And to be able to tell people, especially non-veterans, about what I've experienced, they're excited. Mm -hmm. And then when I get to talk to other veterans, man, we really have something to talk about. We laugh and joke about things, and it's a connection. That's why I like being a civilian and talking to other veterans at the VA, you know, in, in this situation, anywhere, because it's exciting, it's rewarding. Okay. Um, I guess this, you, you've addressed this how do you think your time in the service has made an effect on your life? You, you just mentioned some of the things. Yeah. But. I think uh, my experience in the military was a problem. It was something that um, I will never forget. It is the experience of being in the military uh, showed me, once again, what I made of as a strong black woman. And it's important, especially when we deal with so much racism and sexism and all those types of things. Being in the military, one thing that I've noticed, even addressing relationships, uh, be it a love relationship, a friend relationship and whatnot, I have a tendency to really look towards a person that has a military background because I know there's certain things that they've had to endure, certain things that they've had to do. They know what honor is, what integrity is, you know, and those types of things, what strength is, not just physical strength, but mental strength. Mm -hmm. And because I am a strong <clears throat> black woman, 
that's what I look for in a man now. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think I wouldn't have been as focused on those types of traits on a man had I not been in the military and realized, no, that's what a strong man are. If you want a real man, maybe you do need to look at that. Mm -hmm. how, how do you think it affected your son's life? I think he saw another part of his mom that he was proud of and mm -hmm. that continues to be proud of. Uh, we were close then, we're very close now. Um, I think because of my military experience and other experiences uh, before, during, and after the military, he understands his mother more. And I understand uh, and are, I'm supportive of him. You know, he hasn't joined the military. Um, and I'm not mad about it. Mm -hmm. You know, because we all have our reasons on why we do the things that we do. As long as we feel good about what we do, that's the main thing. I can't force someone to do or believe or uh, make decisions on something that was good for me. The military was good for me, and you know I won't regret anything that ever happened, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, it made me stronger, and um, I continue to gain strength from that. And thinking back on, on just my total experience, I won't forget all the people that I was in the military with. You know, the, the funny times, the, the sad times, the exciting times, like uh, Night March. You know, I felt like I was in a, a horror movie, you know, I mean, real live, and, and watching the bullets, you know, fly, you know, lit up uh, the day march, feeling like I was in a Tarzan movie, <laughs> you know, and with knowing that those were real trainings for if something was to happen. And I'm sure my brothers and sisters now that are going into and have participated in wartime, they needed those same trainings. You know, and it was worthwhile. It was something that brought you back to that what they had at the VA hospital. Freedom isn't free, and we need to understand that. Mm -hmm. Now, when you were in the service, you were still with the Women's Army Corps? Was it still yes, there? Yes, okay. but it was phasing out when mm -hmm. we were becoming Yeah, you said you were just in the transition Yeah, I was in the transition then. stage, so that was exciting. You know, now, so what changes did you see within... Well, we the during the time you were in. Well, what happened is we weren't just a bunch of women uh, soldiers. You know, now we had our male counterparts, our male brothers that were training with us, studying with us, just like here in the community. Mm -hmm. You know, where you have male and female. Mm -hmm. So it, I thought it was a good thing, and it also let um, our male brothers, well, our brothers and sisters, realize that we all have strengths, you know, and that sometimes we do have to work together on uh, situations that demand real strength, real courage, uh, and, and be able to blaze a path and go in a direction that we might not have gone or had to deal with you know, be it all female or all male. Mm -hmm. So it was a good thing. Now, were you able to use um, money from being in the service for college? Of course. <laughs> that was one of the really, really good things. Mm -hmm. um, as I told you before, I ended up finishing my 12 hours of foreign language, as a matter of fact, like what it was, uh, in order to get my undergraduate degree, which is, was in the African American, African American Studies program. And then I continued on with my master's degree, and that was in the multidisciplinary studies program. So I had a Bachelor of Arts and then a Master's of Science. So, and that I can truly say that my educational uh, benefits from, the, uh, from being a veteran were truly, truly uh, an excellent blessing, mm -hmm. and I used Every penny. <laughs> now, how did you get into bricklaying? Wow. You, know, you said you went into that at 50? Yes. At 50 years old, I went into the Bricklayers Union, Local 3, which is, you know, in New York State. And you apprentice? Yes, I'm a third year apprentice. And most of the people that I have trained with are young enough to be my children. <laughs> they have even gone home to tell their mothers and fathers, Wow, there's a lady there that's old as you, or even older. 
So this has been exciting. My, the way I got into the Bricklayers Union, I bought a home from the tax foreclosure auction here in Buffalo a few years ago. And my son, knowing that I'm one of those empowered Now women, what does your son do with you? He's a barber, a licensed uh, master barber. And I have another son that's much younger than him, which is also a licensed master barber. And different people come into the barber shops. And someone came into my older son that was in the military with me, barber shop, and said, you know, they're looking for people in the bricklayers union. And he's thinking, my mom can tackle that. <laughs> she's been in the military. She's done international professional wrestling. She's done everything. She'll do this. And because I had just bought the home, and it was truly a fixer-upper, one of those, you have to do a major home repair. Mm -hmm. So my son told me, Mom, they have you know people that they're looking for for the Bricklayers Union. You might be interested in it because I know you want to fix your house and stuff like that. And at the time, I was uh, briefly unemployed. My son said, here, Mom, it costs $5 to have the application. Here's $5. And, you know, why don't you go check it out? I said, you know what, I'm going to do that. Thanks for hooking your mom up. So I went out there, I filled out the application with that same $5 that my military baby gave me. <laughs> and then, you know, I was called in for an interview. I told them about my background, of course, proudly saying that I was a veteran and all those kinds of things, which did help me to get mm -hmm. in that Bricklayers Union. And uh, after I did that, I started my apprenticeship, which is a four-year apprenticeship, so I'm already most of the way through and still going full force. And I told my son, I said, Cornelius, this $5 that you invested in your mom is going to pay off for you over and over and over. And he also has a home. So I've been able to do some things for him and his home. And, you know, and I told him, it's going to benefit you looking out and it has and every day I think about the blessings that I've had being in the military the children that I've had the, the community activism you know other relatives and friends even during this recent time of the storm you know and knowing that I had friends that I could go to family members that mm -hmm. I could go to all those things make a difference and as I continue to have my courage and strength during this time also it might not be military time as far as being in the civilian streets, but we still had to fare uh, the storm, and we still had to do things, and we still had to come up with the courage, the strength, and you know, and doing and getting things done. And so it still pays off even now as a civilian. Did you ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? Unfortunately, <clears throat> not uh, for the last few years. I have written people because what was really interesting is when you look on the envelopes and you have to return address, a lot of times you can check with uh, the military locators, be it the Navy, the Army, the Marines, mm -hmm. the Air Force, uh, the National Guard. As long as you have the person's full name, rank, and social security number, which I didn't realize how important that was, you could still find people. Mm -hmm. And I have in the past found people, and it was exciting because, you know, a lot of times people don't know that you can do that mm -hmm. and that you can find somebody. And to be able to have found people, even though, you know, time still goes by and everybody has their other lives and things like that, you might not always keep in touch, but to be able to be able to reach out and still touch someone that you shared an experience with was really exciting also. Okay. Um, if you just hold this up like this, mm -hmm. could you tell us uh, where and when that was taken, when you can focus on that? Ooh, okay. That was in the fall of 1976, while I was in basic training at 23 years old, and I guess it's been a little while ago, because now I'm 53 years <laughs> old. But I'm very proud of the picture. And um, you see that, you know, I was a corporal. I also had my, uh, uh, what do you call it? Sharpshooter? Yeah, my sharpshooter and, uh, no, as a matter of fact, it was marksman for marksman. rifle and marksman for uh, rifle. And I always remember, too, 
how we always had to have our inspection for strings and you know it was important to be neat to be clean and uh, because you have all these people that you're with and you don't want to be the cause of disease or disaster so even though you uh, you might think well why do you have to worry about how rank is positioned how this is going your hair being short or long which was another thing for women <laughs> we couldn't have our hair past our collar. And even now, I don't wear my hair past my collar the majority of the time because it's important. It's, you know, it's a safety, health, and, and really a beauty issue for me. Mm -hmm. So this has been exciting. And uh, my parents have this picture. My uh, children have this picture. They all have it displayed. And they're all proud. And I'm honored that they're honored and proud. Now you referred to this one, so we might as well on the tape. Uh, you were a professional wrestler. How long did yes. you do that, and, and when was that? I did that after the military. I briefly even did mud wrestling, which was <laughs> exciting. Um, I think, as a military person, it brought out a lot of other exciting, wonderful things. A lot of times, you know, people are afraid to step out and do things. Mm -hmm be it the military or in civilian life. And I've always been one that I want to do things. So I briefly did mud wrestling, which was exciting. <laughs> then I went into international professional wrestling as Sheena, the voodoo queen from deep dark Africa. And I was the only black lady wrestler here in Buffalo. Again, taking my family in, you know, and letting them see their mom once again, or their daughter, or their niece, or, you know, they were able to see, again, that we shine, we stand out, you know, and that was such a wonderful experience. I did that starting did in 1982 okay. to 1990 uh, when I got my master's degree. Because at the time, uh, the, the main reason that I stopped wrestling is because I had an only daughter and she died of an allergic reaction to Dilantin, which is an anti-convulsion medication for people who had seizures. As I briefly said, I had two sons. Well, one son is 36 and one is 23, but in between that, I had a daughter named Pamela. My younger son is named Kenneth. And what happened is, Pammy was a premature baby. So uh, she made it through the ICN, the intensive care nursery. She was born at two pounds, one ounce, went down to one pound, 14 ounces. Again, knowing that you have to rely on your strength and your courage, I always seem to be able to pull things together, you know, with my military background. And we survived that. But six years later, uh, she succumbed to having the allergic reaction to Dilantin. And uh, she would have been in her mid-20s now. And because of that, and then seven months later, my mother dying of Graves' disease and overactive thyroid, mm -hmm. which is something that um, former President Clinton had. Uh, I just said that you know, wrestling wasn't the, the fun, carefree thing that I had thought it was before. And so I've kind of gotten away from actually doing active wrestling, but I have since been on TV, uh, TV programs, uh, being interviewed about being an international professional wrestler and those types of things. Uh, during the time that I wrestled, I had a wonderful wrestling tour in Malaysia, um, three week wrestling tour, and then I've wrestled all over Canada, different states in the US, so again, being able to feel comfortable in traveling and having that leadership ability, knowing that you feel confident, you know, those things are again, you know, uh, contributions that came from being in military service, but also never taking away that I've always been that type of person within myself. And, but the military helps to bring those things out in you and whatever else you choose to do. Now, did you have to go through any specialized training to be a wrestler? You know, not really. I, I, no. I learned on the road what happened is there was an article in the Buffalo <clears throat> News here in Buffalo, New York that was seeking women to train for professional wrestling. 
And I figured, oh, I'm getting a little hippy because I was a smaller, I was a size eight in the military. So my uniforms were fitting pow pow. And it was, it was really nice. <laughs> she got plenty of action behind that uniform. And um, what happened is, you know, I said, well, my children are young. I could use extra money. I've always been good in gym. My gym teacher used to want me to be a gym teacher. Mm -hmm. I was very good in athletics and I used to always do the demonstrations. It started off at school 39 and my gym teacher was Mr. Gus and he wanted me to be the gym teacher. Never would he have thought that I might not be a gym teacher, but I did become a professional wrestler. I did do something that was active. And so that was really exciting. My, my family was just delighted again. They, people just can't wait, my friends at all. What is she going to do next? And then that's when I went into the brick lane, mm -hmm. you know, and, and doing the brick lane, I've worked within the Buffalo Public Schools, uh, doing pointing, caulking, and cleaning, or doing tile setting, working with terrazzo, marble, and all those different types of things. Now, what is terrazzo? Terrazzo is like um, stone that's on some of the floors that you have in the older oh. schools and things like mm -hmm. that. We have to do polishing, we have to uh, restore other things, so really PCC work, pointing, caulking, and cleaning is actually restoration work. Now there are three things in the Bricklayers Union you can do. You can do brick and block, you can do PCC work, or you could do tile setting. So I've, I'm actually a tile setter, but I've cross-trained with PCC. I have done a little brick and block, but after 53, I'm not trying to continue to just do a brick and block. No, I'm not that guy. You know, so, you know, and I think what's also good is when you know your limitations. Mm -hmm. right. And I think that's something in the military or anywhere else. You need to know your limitations. You need to know and understand what your strengths are. And I think I'm pretty good at that. Well, thank you very much for the interview. Okay. Well, one more question. Uh, when you were in the military police, obviously you had to qualify with, what, the 45 or the 38? The 38, the 45, the M16 were all things that we had to qualify with. And um, that was interesting. We also, if you were not doing something right, you know, there was also some kind of discipline. I thought for a minute I was the push-up queen. Because uh -huh. I, it seemed like something might have gone wrong, and we would have to have our M16s on our wrists, and we'd have to give the push-ups. One drill sergeant, two drill sergeant, with the M16 on our wrists. And that was another memorable event. And, and you know, when we did things like that, you know, we would laugh now, but you better not laugh in formation, because you'll be getting down giving uh -huh. up those push-ups. So we learned to kind of contain our, our laughter in some situations. And uh, if you were coming, another thing that uh, I, I remember offhand is when we came from chow time in the mess halls, you didn't just eat like you eat here, you go to lunch, you leisurely walk back to the office. Oh no, we have to jog back. Mm -hmm. And if you got caught not jogging back, get out and give up the push-ups. You know, so again, you know, if you forgot, it kept you on your toes. You have to always be ready. You know, uh, it could be an officer that's walking by. You have to always look at the rank. And I still do that now. If I see a military person, I will always look on the collar, look at the rank, look at the shoulders, look at the arms. What rank is that person? If it's an enlisted or an officer. And, you know, and I give due respect to whatever that, that rank is. So that's something that has stayed with me also. Okay, well thank you very much for your input. Oh, thank you.